back to Real Talk, the home of raw and relevant conversations. And we are loving all of the interviews that we have lined up. And our next guest is none other than a very special silver medalist from the Winter Games. She has made history in the sport of skeleton. Silver medalist Jack Narricott, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Um, I can't wait to talk about how the bloody hell you got into this sport. I know that there is a uh, family behind it, but we'll get into all the details soon. First things first, <clears throat> we like to start off with our fast five. And these are your questions, if I get right. to them fast enough. All right. Specialty meal to cook. Chili. Oh, like chili con carne. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Good. Favourite meal to cook. Okay. Keeping it basic. I like it. Uh, what about your first kiss? Do you remember your first kiss? It was, oh, I want to say maybe in grade four or five. Why? At school somewhere. Those Queenslanders. Naughty. <laughs> <laughs> what about your worst habit? Oh, there's probably plenty that Dom will tell me. Um. <laughs> half assing like jobs around the house okay oh you're one of them ten, start 10 jobs finish one if that um, depending on what it is yeah okay <laughs> favorite band acdc oh is that like we will we will rock you no that's that that's queen um acdc okay, yeah. is kind of back in black and oh, aussie stuff <laughs> I don't even know why I said that. Okay, we'll leave that to you. Can I get a rendition from you? Can you give me a song? Definitely not. <laughs> Do you have a pet peeve? Being late. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, you're always on time and you, you crack historic times. We we shall know this too. Hey, yeah, uh, one word that best describes you. Resilient, I think. Yeah, there's oh, so. there, there's quite a few. Um well, from a sliding point of view, there were plenty of times where I really should have stopped for either <laughs> financial or health reasons or just like there were so many barriers. Mm. Just like and no. Nah, I had a had a dream and it was it was gonna happen no matter how much it took. <laughs> I mean, it got dangerous there for a period, but yeah. okay. whatever and whenever. Wow. And yeah. look, it, it certainly has paid off. It's incredible what you've achieved. And let's get into that. Um, and before we do, we do just like to thank Workplace Law, who are our proud partners of Real Talk podcast. Shane and Athena lead the team there at workplacelaw.com.au. And they, um, they offer so many different services for female athletes, but particularly just anyone um, who needs some guidance. And if you need any or want any direction for maybe some contractual agreements, or uh, if you need some tribunal representation, they're genuine people who genuinely want to help you uh, and I think that it's very fitting that they're here at Real Talk so they're just passionate about helping players gaining skills um, and confidence off and away from your allocated sport and if you're not an athlete they're also willing to help you and would love to help you as well. Workplacelaw.com.au but now it is time for your story Jackie Narricott. Take us back to a, a young girl in Brisbane, Queensland where you don't see snow but you managed to get to the Winter Olympics. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was a sprinter as a kid, like watching watching Sydney, that was the the kind of kick to go, no, nah, that's I'm gonna be an Olympian. I don't care what sport, I just wanna be an Olympian. Wanted to be a summer Olympian initially, being a Queenslander, that's quite normal. <laughs> um, <laughs> and also my uncle Paul had gone to both the summer and the winter Olympics as a sprinter and then a, as a bobsledder. So that was kind of the the family background wanted to emulate him um and as I got older I quickly well eventually figured out that I, I wasn't fast enough to be to be a sprinter so I started looking at every other avenue to possibly still get there I tried soccer I was a goalkeeper at one point and then happened to be in the right place at the right time to try bobsled um spent two and a half months traveling around Europe bobsledding after uni and before I'd even set foot on ice in the first place, our skeleton coaches saw me and said, you're too small to be a bobsledder. Do you want to try skeleton? And I was like, well, let's just pop the brakes on that. I want to try, try bobsled. That's why I'm here. Let's see if I like that first. And then we'll go from there. 
um, curiosity got the better of me, came home, kind of warned mum and dad that I wanted to try it. And in March of 2012, they're like, all right, well, if you've got the funds, go for it. Not quite realizing what I was about to try and do. <laughs> and <laughs> went, went to the US, tried skeleton from halfway down the track where they basically, like, they throw you down and say, lie there, don't move, you'll be fine. And oh within gosh. two runs, I was hooked. And sorry, sorry. And now we fast forward and you're back in Europe, but you accomplished what hasn't been done before by any Australian. And that was to win the first medal in a sliding event and also to win silver um, at the Tokyo, well, sorry, not Tokyo, Beijing um, 2022 Olympic Games. Can you take us back to that moment, please? Uh, so I'll start with St. Moritz first. Um, and I've, I'd watched our girls like previous before me, we had an AIS program and the girls were really good. They think our best result was a silver on world cup. So I'd, I'd seen them compete and knew that it was possible. And then, but I really wanted to be the first, the first one to win a world cup race and it was getting further and further away. So to, to actually cross the finish line and but I had to be leading a world cup race. None of us apparently had ever done that. So to be the first to lead a world cup race was huge but also felt really normal. Okay. Uh, it was, was, was kind of weird, but very cool. And then to cross the line at first was just unreal. Um, one, of my, one of my best mates was sitting in second and the video of her jumping and screaming and cheering me on the, down the track is my favorite video from that entire week. <laughs> she's, just, she's, just, she's awesome. Um, and then, yeah, to get to Beijing and essentially do it again. I just, I can't believe I've, I did it. It's, <laughs> and Be I was, Beijing is just so surreal in general. Like the, the whole way it happened with, with COVID and how fast we were out and everything. I was talking to one of the British girls yesterday about it and she was like, it seems surreal. Like, oh, good. It's not just me who thinks this whole thing was a dream. <laughs> <laughs> it's real life. Pinch yourself. <laughs> so the, the World Cup circuit, because oh, I just feel like, our audience will just be so encapsulated with this whole story and try and go, but how? Because I always keep thinking, like especially in the lead up, how do you even get involved? And you clearly have so much drive as an athlete that you were looking for any avenue, like you mentioned. And once you get that little taste for it, you're willing to save up all your savings and spend it on competing in a sport where – there was maybe very minimal, if any, support for you financially? Yeah, I was, I've been, been lucky and unlucky in the sense that my first two seasons, uh, we were still an AIS program. So I had a little bit of support to kind of get me going, but it was either they paid for flights or they paid for accommodation and training. Um, in 2014, after Sochi didn't go to plan, we lost everything, which meant that I lost my coach, I lost my teammates, I lost all my funding, which was so much wow. fun. <laughs> Went to throw myself in the deep end and went on to World Cup, have being a second or well, going into my third year of sliding without any support, which is crazy. But in my head, that was the, the only way, the only way to do it. Um, it's just, it's fun. And I don't know, it was, I eventually felt like I kind of found my sport and it's just, it's, yeah, <laughs> the, the things you do. The, sorry, so many of us would have just stopped at even going, ah, uh, we can't, we tried bobsled, like, cool. But the fact that you then persisted um, to, to continue this winter sport that is so rare for Australia, let alone the world, you know, like it, it still is a, a huge event, but in comparison to other sports, it really is not. Um, yeah. Can you talk to me about that funding? So you, you had it, but then after Sochi, because it didn't go to plan, the AIS, Australian Institute of Sport for our audience, uh, stopped it. So how much money did you have to spend? If you don't mind me asking. <laughs> um, without a coach and without new equipment, I think I was spending about 30 grand a year. So bank of mum and dad and credit cards. I owe. <laughs> this, this medal is as much their medal for multiple reasons, but the, the financial reason being, being one of them. Um, Cause without them, 
I don't get to Pyeongchang. And then even even like since since Pyeongchang, where I got um, OWI funding, so Olympic Winter Institute funding, um, and I've I've had I've had a bit of QIS support the whole way through as well, which is, has been good. Um, but yeah, like without without them, none of this happens. Wow! And so having two supportive parents let you follow your dream, and then finishing at Beijing and knowing that you have this silver medal in your hand. Can you explain that? Um, I should be good at this by now, but no. Like it's, <laughs> it's, it's 20 years of hard work and dreams and yeah, 20 years of watching everybody else on TV. Like I, I'm an Olympics tragic, so I watch every sport every olympics but before that um and to see other people doing it like yeah okay that, that makes sense but to then be in that situation and be going out for the medal presentations and seeing a medal that has a the heavy but like yeah. <laughs> to have the heavy medal with the olympic rings on it it was just like this is mine and no one's taking it off me now which is <laughs> which is nice you will ever forever be an Olympian and that is something that yes no one can ever ever take away from you you're also an Olympian with a silver medal which is even cooler and then you're also making history because no other Aussie has ever done that before which is even bloody cooler like I don't even have words and I'm a journalist I just feel like I get soaked up in your emotions are you going to continue while ever my, my head feels good and I love it, then, then yeah, like St. Moritz has World Champs this year. Um, it, it'd be, not, be nice to go back and, and St. Moritz is just fun to slide. World Champs or not, it's the best track in the world to slide. <laughs> but okay. to, be, uh, to, to go and go, you know what? We have 10 runs. Perfect. <laughs> we get to do this like four, day, like, yeah, four days running. Let's go. Wow. Okay, then. Well, then in terms of the sliding events, can you, um, can you explain for us what, training goes into sliding perfectly down this course that what were they calling it in Beijing like um snow dragon or something yes yeah it is it is snow dragon or ice dragon it might have been ice dragon one of the two yeah a dragon anyway (laughs) (laughs) which means it is ruthless um but yeah how do you train for that um a lot of it so the the off season is all sprinting and lifting in the gym trying to get as fast and powerful as we can for the start some people have push tracks so there's a few scattered around europe and there's one in the one in bath um, i have a push sled on wheels to to do that and then once we get on ice it's just trying to get runs um on as many tracks as you can and learning how to be super subtle and precise there's a lot of video that goes into it behind the scenes um and mental mental work like uh, visualization which i'm terrible at but <laughs> But trying to to know that to know the tracks inside out so that when you get to race day you can you know that you can push hard you lie down and then you can your body goes into autopilot you you know what's coming you understand what each corner is and what you're trying to get out of each corner and you can just let it flow and it's almost a dance with the track because you're trying to work with it for for the most part like that's that's how you go fast and and what's the top pace like what's your top speed on a track Mine's only, I say only, um, 138.9 k an hour. Head first, I, I people. Say, yeah, I say only because I've got friends who have done 143. But sorry, I, I mean, <laughs> once you get beyond 120, I'm not sure that there, it matters if it's 130 plus, you know, like every little. That's on the track. <laughs> that's insane. I mean, you must love the thrill and the adrenaline that it gives you. But there has been trying times um, and a scare. So, oh, yeah. Can, yeah, I'm sure there's been more than one scare. But when was there a time where you thought, okay, maybe I have to contemplate giving this up because of concussion or health reasons? This last concussion. So, after 2018, uh, I got back on ice the following season and got concussion within my first couple of runs. Um, the track in Calgary has a bump in Chrysler, which is a 360 degree corner. And I smacked it first run, had a bit of a headache, smacked it again, even harder, run two. 
and it was at that point I was like okay like I don't usually want to get off my sled I came out of Crasland and I wanted to get off my sled um went kind of so at that point I had I kind of had a coach from an IBSF so our international federation it was a development camp so there was a coach around but no physio no doctor um I was having to figure out am I concussed what's going on um am I okay <laughs> and it wasn't until I got home and couldn't look at my phone for more than like 30 seconds wanted to sleep all the time got back from 10 days off the ice from that just kind of I stupidly kept trying to do things I kept going to, going to training and going okay well I'll track walk get a headache okay that's me done tried to warm up for pushing I bent over and felt dizzy okay that's oh, me gosh. done for the day um <laughs> got back um slid was was sliding really well got to eagles in austria in january 2019 and that track's bumpy but and i it, and i don't usually get along so me being in tears after training isn't necessarily unusual for that track but according to friends i was really unresponsive at the bottom of the run um and like the runs weren't that bad so i shouldn't have been in tears there were a few like the the subtle emotional signs that were starting to creep back in again and then we got to St. Moritz, which is hand cut. It's the smoothest ice in the world because it's, it's made from snow. Um, and I got off the sled and I felt dizzy. And I was really unresponsive to, to questions. I just like dazed and out of it. And the Canadians who I was being coached by at the time basically said, we're not comfortable sending down the track. No way. <laughs> this, is, like, this, is, this is how we, how we end your career if we send you down again. Um, got home back to the UK went and saw a uh, neurologist because at this point OWI were involved in the mm, <laughs> we need to like get you seen properly they diagnosed post-concussion syndrome and then the longer I was in the UK and the adrenaline w- was wearing off from tour I couldn't walk around town without feeling feeling like I was drunk for like 20 minutes I'd feel drunk <laughs> wow. so six months of rehab with the vestibular physio back in back in Oz, um, we figured out that my eyes weren't focusing right. They were converging too soon. There was a whole bunch of little things. So thankfully, the MRI showed that my brain was was okay. There was no evidence of any brain injury. Thankfully, because that that would have been that would have for sure been the end of it. Yeah, yeah. I got back on the sled in October of 2019, having had the conversation with my sports psych that, well, what happens if I'm dizzy? If this first run from halfway down the track goes badly, what does that mean? Um, and I really wanted it to, to be black and white, to be like, okay, well, it's either going to be, I'm going to be dizzy or I'm not. I don't want there to be this gray area because I didn't, I wasn't going with the physio. I was going on my own mm. and having this physio support back home or you're at wherever Caney happened to be. Um, so yeah, that was a, was confronting having to have the conversation with Rich about, what happens if this doesn't go to plan because that was not a conversation I wanted to have <laughs> but I'm glad we had it because then it meant that I could I could go to Whistler knowing that we had a we had a plan in place for good or for bad and thankfully <laughs> I survived in the first run I was far more nervous for my first run back after that concussion than I had yeah. been for any other run in my entire life I mean understandably so so yeah. how long did it take for you to, was it close to a year before you realized how much trauma your brain had suffered? Oh, not your brain, your, your concussion, sorry. Um, so I'm looking back, I'm, I was fairly certain I was concussed for the entire 2018-19 season that, that I slid yeah. or at least had like had varying, varying forms of it. Um, wow. I was definitely concussed for, for like the, the last race I did it that season, I finished 10th. And I was definitely concussed for that. <laughs> looking, look, like, look, looking back on it, I was dizzy. And yeah, somehow went again. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a... It's a fine the, the line. Things you do, when, you, like, when, you, when you don't want to admit to it, but mm. since then, I am so much more careful now. And I'm so, it drives me nuts on tour hearing people say they've got a headache or the track's bumpy. Um, but they keep going again and again and again. It's like, guys, just pump the brakes. <laughs> yeah. Our heads are important, but I think it takes going through concussion 
to understand, okay, this doesn't feel good, this isn't normal, and kind of understanding the potential ramif- long-term ramifications of it. But in our sport, there's so many stories about people who, from like, we call it sledhead, with the, the, the micro vibrations that you get from every track, but the tracks that are bumpy, it's, it's even worse. Um, it's even got a nickname. They have, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. that's not But good. thankfully, no, when I first came to the sport, the, the idea of you saying you had a headache and not going in because you had a headache was really frowned upon, being like, oh, just harden up, you'll be fine. It's just a headache. Mm-hmm. But now as it's moved on, thankfully that's becoming a lot more acceptable that well at least in certain countries so with us the canadians the brits the americans to a certain extent if you say i'm not going again my head doesn't feel okay the answer is okay that's fine okay it's not you're soft go again thankfully um a lot of of countries you left out though which is concerning there's a long way to go yeah it is but part of that too is also because i've got more friends in those countries and I, I've seen okay. a bit more of the the inner workings of the, like my husband being British I understand a bit more of what goes on to, to like, as a very small extent what goes on within that program and then being part of the Canadian program then you, you, you kind of um, get to understand like their, their concussion protocols and you understand a bit more about that like the Germans could very well have it but we don't necessarily know about it um, yeah but they're, okay. they're also the ones throwing themselves down the track 15 times a week. <laughs> Guys. <laughs> oh, wow. It, it is. It's. I, uh, I reckon I'm going to listen back to this podcast and all I've said is, wow. Oh, my gosh. But I'm sure our audience will also be thinking the same thing. After you got that silver medal, uh, how, what's it been like? Um, that first week was crazy it was really hectic. it was great I, I loved every second of it so <laughs> we were out of the village within 48 hours of competing so there was we got I think they've like, had like a post-race party where, where everyone was just like it was the first chance we had all season to actually chill and hang out together without worrying about COVID it was great um media on a plane yeah 48 hours later back to Oz I got to see my friends and family for the first time in two and a half years, which was so nice. Met my nephew and my best mate's baby. And there's so much that's been happening in Oz that we haven't seen. Um, Got to do some like cool TV and lots of interviews, but it's been, I I think it's helped lessen some of the post-Olympic depression that tends to kick in after that because that was so busy and hectic and um, enjoyable that mm. I think it's kind of negated a few of those feelings, which has been, been good. Yeah. And I, and I would love for you just to make sure you know that you're like the superstar. Everybody, everybody's frothing how great you did. And, and it was in a time that we really needed something to cheer for too. Like, I think that's almost been a bit of a bonus. Sure. You didn't get that lead up hype that would normally happen in a normal year, but we don't know what normal is these days. <laughs> Um, and I think that it was, it was everywhere. Everybody wanted a piece of the Olympic games, which was great despite it being in Beijing, which is another situation on its own. But did you enjoy your time there? Yeah, we did. Um, it was very, uh, bubble like because because it had to be and China was, was super strict on where we couldn't, couldn't go. Thankfully our element was the entire villages and all the competitions. So if we, wanted to we could go between villages we could go watch um if we had time we chose so dom and i chose to be very insular to mm-hmm. avoid any chance of getting covid we didn't go yeah. to the dining hall didn't go to the rec hall pretty much whatever we could do to avoid people we we did and the aoc <laughs> were fantastic in facilitating that they right. had we had we had a common room in our village which was just stocked full of food they sent a massive container over from oz to, to kit us out so we didn't have to go to the dining hall if we didn't want to or that's yeah, it was, great it was good yeah yeah the, it was a the environment in the village was was very safe and calm and chilled I think because everyone was still in that okay we don't really want to go out we don't really want to see people we want to go to training we're going to come back and that is it and stay COVID free because we, we saw <laughs> so many headlines over at the Winter Olympics and it was if you caught it catch you later get out 
um, and, and being ISO. So what, what's next for, for Jackie Narcott? Get a job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I've just finished my, my do that. here in Iran. Well, you know, I kind of have to. <laughs> I'd like to actually be a, like, uh, yeah, functioning member of this household and, and contribute to, to rent and bills and just be, begin to, to find who I am outside of being an athlete. Um, mm-hmm. So that what well, plus I'm not I'm not retiring just yet. Like the that that time is starting to to come closer. That that's just facts of age and life and, and all the rest of it. So I I would like to be prepared for for when that time comes, whenever it happens to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also just yeah, start to to figure out who I am outside of being an athlete and just also they like, try and. Um, settle into life over here a bit more like it's the last years has been very <laughs> lonely and isolating being going to training and then coming back home and it'd be nice to get a, get out a little bit out of, a little bit more for sure uh sorry I cut you off but what did you finish studying uh, I've done my diploma of interior design so and is that where you want to you want to work is that what you want to get a job in yeah cool yeah shout out like idiot. <laughs> <laughs> where are you living at the moment I mean uh, in Bath, yeah, in the UK. In, in Bath, okay. So, uh, look, we've got we've got lots of listeners actually over there. Uh, so yeah. you can have a silver medalist work for you. <laughs> we see what we can do. <laughs> yeah, anything, that's so anything in the design field, be, be good. Yeah, wow. Use your creative flair. Um, we have, yeah, I, I feel so stoked to be able to have this conversation with you, and I love that we've been able to show some of your personality and, and talk about the road that has shown so much resilience, which is ironic being the one word that describes you. But Jack, good luck with the next chapter and we'll all be watching so proudly from afar and um, wearing that green and gold makes us so proud to see you and, and especially that silver medal. So congratulations. Thank you. The The support from home was unbelievable. I got home and hearing today from the whole, we, we stayed up and so did all of our friends and family. I was like, what do you mean you guys stayed up? Like no one stays up to watch me compete. This is just so Yeah, cool. they do. Yeah. 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 No, it's so deserved. And I hope that it feels like all that hard work has paid off because it's um it's very cool what you've done. Literally. Cool. Cold. <laughs> I'm going to stop with the lame jokes. I reckon it's been half an hour of my lame jokes and your really cool story. I can't wait to meet you in person. Until we do, best of luck with everything. And uh, yeah, really appreciate your time. Thank you.